Hello and welcome to Beyond Well. I'm Sheila Hamilton. You know, I had one goal when I started this podcast, and that was to bring zero cost information to you about mental health and the evidence-based tips that you can use to stay well together. And as part of that promise, I only partner with organizations or people whose products I really believe in. So I'd like you to know more about Active Recovery TMS. TMS is an evidence-based non-drug therapy for depression and OCD. And if your depression medication has failed to bring you relief, transcranial magnetic stimulation is both safe, it's effective, and it's covered by most insurances. My late husband did not respond well to antidepressants or mood stabilizers, and I would have given anything to know that there are other remedies for depression that have been studied, tested, and FDA approved. TMS is targeted to the specific area of the brain that is underactive in depression and overactive in OCD. And the patient testimonials, which we're going to be sharing, are so emotional. These people literally have their lives back after undergoing treatment. I believe in the entire team at Active Recovery TMS, and they'll work with you on an individual basis to make sure you get relief. TMS therapy is covered by most insurance plans and with multiple locations in Oregon and Washington, there is a location near you. Learn more at activerecoverytms.com. Welcome back to Beyond Well. I'm Sheila Hamilton, and this is a program for people who want to learn more about our interior lives. And I am so thrilled to introduce you to my next guest, Andrea Heron. She's a seasoned HR executive. She's author of There's an Elephant in Your Office, and she's host of the HR Scoop podcast. She's a passionate advocate for addressing mental health in the workplace, bolstering diversity, inclusion, and belonging, and she tenaciously strives to implement values-driven leadership. I think it's fantastic also that you say it's so important for every single workplace to have a healthy sense of humor. Thanks a lot for being with us. Yeah, I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you. So, Andrea, I just like your first blush of how you think the pandemic really lifted this topic to such an important profile. Yeah, I mean, honestly, although there weren't that many positives that came out of COVID, one thing that could be um, is it gave us the mental health revolution that we needed. Yeah, you know, I think we've really pushed forward a long way out of necessity simply because we could no longer ignore the fact that people were struggling and that it did impact their work in their day to day. So it became a workplace issue. I really want to talk with you about specifics because we have been talking with our other experts about sort of here's generally what's been happening in corporate America because of it. But I want you to talk very intimately with managers out there because we know that a lot of this work for identifying mental health concerns and actually helping the employee through them falls to the manager. So first of all, just some broad advice to managers about how would you be thinking differently this year than you might have been pre-pandemic? I agree. We've talked a lot about it, and now we've got to get to the how-to. And the number one thing any manager can do is understand the basic platform, how people show up, how they are themselves, when they bring themselves. Is it consistent? Do you start to see slips? Is someone, you know, who's usually very put together looking extremely disheveled mm -hmm. or, you know, like what are those little things that seem off or mm -hmm. different that could be an indication that someone's having a hard time also with coping mechanisms, you know, as we've all been a little bit less guarded in our homes and on zoom, you know, you may have caught mention of someone getting the hundredth package delivered over the week or that they've been gambling again or picked up smoking again. And, you know, just knowing that people are reaching for those unhealthy coping mechanisms is a sign that they are struggling with their mental health, which absolutely impacts the way they bring themselves, their creativity, their ability to produce the work and just show up as the employee that they want to be. One of the things that I think most people end up really being concerned about is how much legally can I say? how much can I do? So would you give us some advice in that realm? Absolutely. And good instincts. That should be a question that you're asking yourself because it is a, a little bit of a slippery slope here. 
um, you can show empathy and concern and advocate support and benefits and resources. But what we don't want to do is cross into asking things of a personal medical nature, personal relationship status, you know, you're going to steer away from rumor mills, from detailed diagnoses or medication questions. And the rule of thumb that I like to use and tell my managers is to tie all questions to observable behaviors related to work performance. Mm -hmm. You really can't get off track if you're talking about things that are showing up in the work performance yeah. and anything else you just leave to the side. One of the most important foundations that one can lay for being able to have this is to actually know enough about the person, to know enough about their family, to know enough about their exterior pressures, to be able to have this conversation and do some active listening and things like that. How do people who maybe didn't get trained in how to be emotional learners or emotional receivers or emotional managers learn to have this kind of relationship with their employees? The truth is all humans want to feel heard. We all want to be seen and validated and feel like people are listening. And the question we really have to ask ourselves is how are we doing with that? How distracted are we? Are you giving your full attention? My guess is you're not. You're sending an email, you're side chatting, you're texting, you've got a music on in the background and people know that. They're smart enough to understand when they're not getting your full attention. That's step one. Um, step two is to let them talk. Because if you are already three back and forths in the conversation ahead of where it is in reality, you're maybe missing the point completely. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you took a different direction because you weren't actually listening to what they said. Mm -hmm. And the best piece of advice I could give, and this applies just as much at home as it does in the workplace, but if someone does start to come to you and unload or vent, the very, very best thing you can do is pause them. Say, I really want to hear this, but first, let me clarify. Do you want me to just listen or do you want me to help you problem solve? Mm. This was a game changer because clearly we all have great ideas and everyone wants us to solve their problems. Well, it turns out they don't. And nine times out of 10, they really just want you to hold that space and listen to them. They're not even ready for a solution. Let's talk about the rate of more serious mental illness that's showing up in the workplace, according to the Kaiser Foundation, has really vastly increased. And so you are going to run across more people who might have an active depression, might be really coping with debilitating anxiety. So your previous advice, tie it all to performance. Let's take that one step further then. How do you begin to say, I'm noticing this with regards to your performance? Then what? What are the next steps? Well, of course, every individual is going to be different. And it's important not to just say that, but to actually know that. Mm -hmm. And so you do have to have some kind of baseline relationship. You need to understand where are they slipping? You know, are they missing a deadline? And then you could ask them, is there a tool? Is there an organization? Is there a priority list I could help you with? You know, what is a tactical thing that you could shift or do to really meet them where they are? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's an accommodation. You know, maybe there's something simple that could be done with a start time or a break time or to let them go to a counseling appointment in the middle afternoon mm -hmm. that is reasonable. I think it takes the manager working with that person to really come up with a solution together. You're not going to be prescriptive and say, I know how to solve your problems, but things like creating regular work schedules, regular consistent assignments. And the thing here with consistency is things will change always. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But if someone is struggling with their mental health, the more advanced notice you can give that something might change or that a change is coming gives them additional time to process and buffer and be ready for that change. And they generally don't do well with surprises. What I hear most from managers is how difficult it is once someone has been diagnosed with a mental illness, because then they fall into the Americans with Disabilities Act and there's all kinds of different protections. So how do you give them enough work to make sure they get challenged, enough work that they feel supported and part of a team and not so much that they feel overwhelmed? Yeah, I mean, that is the... Million dollar worked, question. It is. And that may change. What worked for them six months ago may no longer work. Maybe better, maybe not. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's a constant interactive process. It does have to work for both sides. And I think that's something that 
managers, especially and business leaders can get nervous about like, oh, now we have to bend over backwards and do all of these things or spend this money or make these accommodations. And it's only one way. It Mm -hmm. still does need to work for the business, but we have to zoom out and say, what is actually important? Mm. Like what actually matters? Does it matter if they start at a different time? If they're getting the work done? Probably not. You know, I think it's great that you uh, named your book, There's an Elephant in Your Office. And I want you to talk about the reason for that title and how important it is for people to realize how we masquerade at the workforce and really don't bring our real selves to our workplaces. Yeah, well, the whole book began when my sister called me a few years ago and outrushed this flood of emotion of she was going to get fired and she was having a tough time and her therapist and her medications. And what? I had no idea. Mm. She had struggled with severe anxiety and depression on her own privately her whole life. Mm. And there weren't resources. There weren't, there wasn't enough information for her sister in HR who cared very much to even be able to help her. Mm. And it was just a huge gap in making this information understandable and relevant for managers, not just legal or the laws and all of those terms. One thing she told me was that she spent so much time and energy trying to act normal and fit in. She calls it cubicle camouflage that she was exhausted and couldn't even give her all to the work that she really wanted to do because of that shame and stigma. I I just knew right away, if I didn't know this about my own sister, plenty of people in my organization and every organization were also dealing with this. We just don't know it, but that doesn't mean it's not there. And something had to be done to, to help bring it to the forefront. You also talk about beyond the elephant. There are other sort of breeds of people who kind of show up in the office in the way that they're managing their mental health. Talk about some of those, if you would. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a whole variety of people. You know, you have the oversharers who don't have boundaries about what is okay and understand that sometimes people have a right not to know your business. Um, you have those who, you know, want to stir the pot or who shut down or explode mm-hmm. be with emotion. And, you know, as an HR professional, unfortunately, I've seen my fair share of those. And trust me, no one wants to have an emotional outburst at work. No mm-hmm. one wants to cry at work. It's a terrible day. And so there are realities, though, that we are a whole person and we're the same person wherever we go. So noticing the warning signs and working with people along the way so it doesn't get to that explosive point is really important. So much of what we learn in business school and what we learn in any kind of managerial training is all about Excel. It's about budgets. It's about everything else. What you're describing really takes soft skills. It takes that kind of emotional aptitude that many people really do not have. So beyond the reading your book beyond going to seminars to learn how to talk more openly about mental health. Do you have any other suggestions for people about how they can become more emotionally intelligent to do this work? You're exactly right. These are not things, even HR professionals are taught if you go the traditional business school route. And that's such a travesty because we're dealing with humans. So there are a couple of tools that I think any manager would be well advised to use. And one of my favorite is called the take 10 check-in. Mm -hmm. It is very, very simple, but it gets to the point of understanding that baseline of behavior for Mm -hmm. individuals. And so there are three very simple questions. How are you doing? Mm -hmm. How's the team doing? And how can I help? Mm. So when you ask, how are you doing? You'll get an answer. Depending on your relationship, the depth of that will be what it is. But when you ask, how's the team doing? you're much more likely to get richer information about the dynamics, the problems, and some personal feelings as well. We'll mix in there. And then how can I help? If you get an answer to that, well, that's amazing. Then you know how you can help. But if you do that regularly and take 10 just means it should be 10 minutes or less. And if you get really good at it, it's less than 10 minutes. But if you check in with people regularly, then it becomes a pulse. I've also heard people say, what's your word of the day? Mm Mm-hmm. And that can also work. I think that one of the biggest obstacles that I'm hearing people repeat again and again is 
the distance that remote work puts between us for any astute manager to be able to truly figure out how that person is doing. They don't have as much face time with them. They don't see them in the hallways. They can't really judge for if you've allowed people to go off camera and, and you've allowed them to go off camera, they can't judge what's really going on. So how do we do this with the reality that remote work is going to be with us for some time to come? Yeah, we are going to have to reconsider how we connect with each other. And it mm. will take more effort because it's not the casual bump in or talking at the coffee machine. Yeah. It is so important to keep regular one-on-ones, mm. even if they're not on camera, yeah. maybe you take it as an opportunity if you can to do a walking one-on-one or to, mm. you know, get some movement in there while you can give people a break away from the screen, but maintaining those regular check-ins, doing a team stand-up once, twice a week, um, I've seen be really effective. Also, you could schedule non-work related like social breaks. So for mm-hmm. example, we just started doing coffee breaks every mm-hmm. other Friday. It's 30 minutes. It's no agenda, no pressure, but whoever shows up, we break out in smaller groups just to chat yep. or you could utilize if you have a chat function or tool, if you have rooms or groups for different things like music lovers or parents or pets mm-hmm. to really create a sense of community within your organization, even while you're remote. You know, the thing that I feel most buoyed about when it comes to talking about mental health in the workplace is that young millennials and younger really value mental health programs, mental health support. They name it as one of their real necessities of work. I'm wondering how you've seen this younger generation of worker change the workplace and what you see for the future because of their agitation and their real direct action. Yeah, they certainly have led the way in helping to at least reduce the stigma and shame a little bit, even if it's through memes. Um, They have a lot more comfort and confidence to acknowledge what's going on and be open about it. Um, And also, I think for the, the future, it is here to stay. These services, I think, were lagging to begin with, and they're certainly not going away. It's not a trend. It's not a ping pong table in the break room. It is going to be a new staple. And to that end, one thing I really see coming in the future of benefits and how we operate in a company is choice. And this isn't just for the younger generations, for all of us, every single thing in our life is curated. Mm -hmm. Our newsfeed, our music, how we consume anything and everything, how we're advertised to, it is all curated to our individual likes and choices Mm -hmm. with the exception of where we work. Here's your pay date. Here's your benefits package. Take it or leave it. Here are the hours that you work and you have to come to this building and do your work in this chair. That's just not going to hold for much longer. The more progressive companies or those who want to keep and maintain that good talent of all ages are going to figure out how to flex and offer different options. It could be anything, financial wellness, mental health, I think will just be a staple, but maybe their add-ons are different things, you know, um, child and family planning, inclusive of non-traditional families, you know, good adoption, LGBTQ plus needs. You know, I think we really are entering a much more highly individualized era quite frankly, a bit overdue. Yeah, no kidding. I I do think it's important to note that many of the best companies who are really taking this seriously and moving the needle fastest have integrated mental health into diversity, equity, belonging. Why is that so important and why does it work that way? I think the belonging is the next letter that's going to be in that acronym because we can be diverse, we can include, we can try to be equitable, but if people don't feel like they belong, they're still not going to bring their full selves and capabilities to the work. And if you think about it, mental health is part of a person's overall experience, which is heavily influenced by culture, background, religious expectations, and upbringing. And so the way one religious group or culture or anyone operates in the resource Resources they seek out will be different. And then the providers that are available that resonate with that person, if they're not a white person. Right. So much of the stress that we hear from people, especially people of color and people in the BIPOC community, they have told me that there is not a sense of belonging because even when they do try to reach out to help, A, very difficult to get, that's for everyone, but B, there are no people of color providers. 
And so people haven't even begun to source their EAPs to make sure that they're diverse. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And I think that is one very tangible step that anyone who participates in, in reviewing those plans and providers yeah. could take and should take as soon as possible. I, I want to ask because um, your book is really good around some of the techniques that make people not feel more stigmatized. And I'd like to go over some of those, how talking about um, mental health issues, even from the time you call someone into your office, I love how you describe how important this is to make that first meeting really not feel like you're blaming them for something they've done wrong. Would you talk about that just a little, Andrea? Absolutely. So I have seen firsthand many times when I say, oh, could you come into my office and shut the door? You know, yeah. Fear, panic, terror, and then no one hears anything after that. So the one of the best things you can do is add a subject. What is this about? If it's not about that person, say so. Mm -hmm. If you want to brainstorm, say so. And that also gives them time to actually think about the ideas that they would like to bring. Mm -hmm. So again, it goes back to giving people time and space to process and if you spring a meeting, you don't put anything in the context and you say, shut the door or, you know, in the virtual world, like hop on a call real quick, your people's fight or flight will become percolating and you, yeah. they won't be able to be present and actually hear what it is, which probably isn't anything bad. So why put them through that? Yeah. I want to talk about how you bring someone back into the workplace who has taken a leave of absence for either psychiatric care or just stress relief. How do we make sure that teams both abide by the adjustment that this person is going through and also support them at the same time? Yeah, I certainly have had these situations and as everything else, we're individuals. So you have to know the person and it depends on how close the team is. So if you have a best friend on the team who knows more than the most, you know, sometimes they can help buffer and answer questions without being too personal. Of course, we do not want to be giving people's personal health information or reasons for being out, but we can absolutely say, you know, this person has been on leave. They're going to be returning part time or for these hours or days you know, their workload is going to be a little different as we get them back up to speed. So thank you for your patience. We're really excited to have them back. Um, if you have any questions about that, let me know. Mm -hmm. And that way the manager is owning it. There's not the rumor mill. We're not speculating. Mm -hmm. It's just here are the facts for this amount of time. We're going to reintegrate. And then we're really excited. Yeah. I also think that it's important to note, just given the increase in the suicide rate in the past three years, what would be best practices after someone has lost someone to suicide? Yeah. I mean, it is difficult. Of course, you know, they should take whatever time that they need to grieve and, and be with their family or loved ones for that time period. And then the name here of what to do is flexibility. And that's going to be true for a lot of situations because it might be a personal trauma or it could be something that happened to a close family member. And we need to recognize that leading with empathy and care mm. and being as flexible as possible to helping that person feel supported not only helps them as a human, but if we zoom out for the business people in, in the audience here, it helps the business because they're going to be more loyal. They're mm. going to appreciate that so much that they mm. felt supported through one of the most difficult moments in their life. And they're going to bring that value back to your organization as soon as they can. And if you rush it or try to gloss over it or make them move quicker, all of that is going to backfire. I, I can just attest because I have three different clients who have gone through one with a workplace suicide and two others with personal suicides. And the companies did so much great work and really prepared the people around them to be supportive, to be open and to not be gossipy around it. And those people came back, they're soaring through the managerial levels. They have so much loyalty toward the company for how they were treated during that really difficult time. It's absolutely the case. You know, you get sort of superstar clients out of crisis if you do treat them correctly. 
Yeah. And it, all it takes is a little empathy and patience Mm -hmm. and being flexible of like, okay, but how do we still meet what we need to meet? How can we be creative? How can we shift things around or get the temporary support Mm -hmm. to make this work for the long term Mm -hmm. versus trying to force it to work in this moment? Okay. Let's briefly go over benefits. What are the best, most progressive companies offering that other people might compare themselves to? Bring your pets to work. People love a pet. In Mental office. health, number one, <laughs> easiest thing to do. Yeah. And if that doesn't work, or if you have a, a distributed workforce paying for some kind of doggy daycare or something like that, I've seen as a huge perk that people really enjoy. Um, another one is support with student loans. Mm-hmm. I've seen this specifically more in areas where there's a required degree or a required advanced degree, like in the veterinarian services where they will do payback of student loans as it escalates with tenure. Yeah. So I think that is a great retention tool and a total win-win. Okay. Um, so those are, are definitely the top two. And then what's becoming just now standard is telehealth. Mm-hmm. You know, so before that might've been an extra benefit because we didn't all need it or have it, but going forward, people really expect to be able to access services online. Yeah. Andrew, you're so easy to talk to. I could talk to you all day about this stuff because I know we're both fascinated by it. Have there been any surprises for you about some of the benefits, um, the resilience that people are are showing in light of the pandemic and now this terrible, terrible, um, you know, world event that could lead to a huge world war? Who knows what's going to happen next? How do people fall back on the resilience tools we've learned over the pandemic to be okay with their mental health? It's a great question. You know, I think people have really rallied in their local communities and have reoriented themselves to who's in my neighborhood? Mm -hmm. What local businesses do I not want to close? So I'm going to make a conscious effort to order from or purchase from, you know, what can I walk to? Um, I've seen a lot of the little libraries that people are building outside their homes as library shares Mm -hmm. or, you know, doing things together to raise money for a cause or to come together to make cards for nursing homes, especially when everyone was locked down and Mm -hmm. those uh, residents were especially lonely and vulnerable. Yeah. Um, So what I've seen is just the great humanity of people staying connected in new ways and kind of reintroducing the idea of play and fun and how we can not doom scroll, not stay in the news to where it's unhealthy, but what is a healthy amount to stay informed? How can I actually contribute to my community and stay connected to my colleagues now that we're separated? Yeah. And you know, it's so funny that that level of information overload is so different for every single person. As a person who used to work news 12 to 14 hours a day today, I only read my news. I will not watch it on television. I refuse to have the sensationalism sort of battered at me. Mm -hmm. And I also just love reading deeply about world events and what's happening rather than trying to do Instagram or TikTok information. It's too much on your brain to have something this important be rat-a-tat-tatted to you. Yeah. And it's never ending. I mean, for some people, they they want nothing and they want to stick their head in the sand, which is not the right choice just as much as complete scrolling endlessly is probably not the right choice either. There's a balance there. Anything else, Andrea, that you want to sort of add? I've loved this conversation so much. Yeah. I think the only thing that I would love to add is the idea of toxic positivity. Mm -hmm. Some people are familiar, some aren't, but the idea here is that when only positive emotions are allowed especially by leaders and managers, when the only messages are posi vibes only, every day is a good day, you know, don't, don't be negative. That can become very toxic very quickly because not every day is great. Sometimes it is bad and we need to be able to express that without fear of retaliation or without shutting down and not contributing ideas or thinking outside the box because it isn't posi vibes mm. is just really prevalent though, because it's all well-intended. And those phrases, just to be clear, aren't inherently bad, but if they're the only ones allowed, that's where it can quickly become 
toxic and give you the opposite reaction that you're looking for. Again, going back to a lot of young users who are really open about what they don't like about the workplaces, they call it fake culture, that everybody's so positive and moved and every day is the best opportunity to do your best. And sometimes it's just okay to go do your work, really. Right, exactly. Yeah, Yeah. it's been wonderful to talk. Want to thank Ashley Sides Johnson, who is Andrea's co-author on this. There's an elephant in your office, practical tips to successfully identify and support mental and emotional health in the workplace. It's really been an extraordinary ride. And I love that your book is out in the world. Thanks again, Andrea. Thank you so much for having me. If you've been listening and loving the podcast, as some of you say you have, please give us a thumbs up wherever you listen. Thanks again. And make it a great day. Bora Health is a nonprofit alcohol and drug treatment center in Portland, Oregon, that has been helping youth, adults, and families for nearly 50 years. They offer compassionate, comprehensive, and affordable care for everyone, regardless of background, orientation, or ability to pay. Bora recently opened a new state-of-the-art campus in Portland's Southeast Gateway District, and the entire campus is healing and supportive. You can find out more about their full array of evidence-based therapies for drug and alcohol treatment at www.forahealth.org. If you or a loved one needs support, there are many options and personalized approaches to care. Reach out to Fora Health at 503-535-1151 or see the show notes for more details.